Hi students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science and Module 7 on Climate Science. This is video number 8. We're continuing our little mini-series looking at ancient climates and this time on fossils and microfossils. So what we need to be able to do is describe and discuss ancient evidence of variations in global temperature including but not limited to fossils and microfossils. I was very fortunate when I was a postgrad uh, undertaking my master's study to have the opportunity to wander around We Jasper and when you do that you can find some absolutely fantastic fossils that just look like stones underneath your feet. Uh, brachiopods in particular were one very significant um, and very common fossil that, that I found in that area and certainly plenty of other people have done the same sort of thing since. Fossils just like rocks can also be used to infer ancient climates. And just like rock layers, when we look at different layers of rock and we see different layers overlaying others, and we can conclude from some of the types of rocks that we see what types of environments may have led to their formation, so we can also make similar sorts of conclusions when we start to look at the fossils that are in those rocks. So marine fossils, for example, that might be in a particular layer that's then overlain by a layer that contains terrestrial fossils could tell us something about changes in climate associated with changes in sea level. Of course, mountain building can also take areas where maybe they were formed in a shallow sea or ocean uh, or some sort of a other type of environment, swamp environment, for example, and then due to uplift have then been raised uh, well above the level of the sea that we find uh, these days. So, for example, fossils in Himalayan mountains certainly are suggestive that uh, those sorts of areas or at least at the time of rock and fossil formation, um, that those areas were much uh, lower altitudes than they are today. One of the great things about fossils is that we continue to find more and more of them and we're able to continue to uh, build a story of what's actually happened in the geological past. This was a little story that came out not too long ago um, from the uh, ABC News. And one of the things that we want to be looking at um, in terms of our study of climate science is a range of different sources of material and what sort of information that they are passing on, both in terms of the um, science associated with those articles and also some of the conclusions that those are coming to and what they're basing those conclusions on. So this was an interesting little article and I've included it here because basically it was just a farmer doing his job, doing his daily work when he found um, rocks in the way of, of where he was ploughing and one of the consequences of looking at those rocks was that he found some absolutely fabulous, very well preserved fossils. The fossils were subsequently studied and have uh, been so over a couple of years and have proven to be of a very, very high quality. And this is one of the things when we're looking at fossils is the quality of preservation, which allows us to make more, uh, I guess, precise assumptions about what was going on in the those ancient environments. So fish, for example, whose stomach contents may be uh, so well preserved that we can get a clue to their diets pollen grains that were preserved on the bodies of insects and we looked at pollen previously and how important pollen is to help us to determine the uh, nature of the flora in an ancient environment. What's interesting about this is that the fossils have been aged around the Miocene and so um, from about 23 million years ago we know that there was quite a diversity of plants and animals but that there were some changes that were happening in the climate that uh, led to some widespread extinction events around 14 million years ago. So when we find new fossils, we get an opportunity to start to, I guess, complete pieces of the puzzle, or at least fill in a few more pieces of our puzzle to get an idea of what's actually been going on in the past. All fossils tell us something about ancient environments, but not all of them are conclusive in terms of how they link to climate science. So this is probably one of the best known plant fossils uh, and certainly one of the most widespread. Glossopterus is a beautiful fossil and often the shells in which it's found um, are, are highly coloured and therefore highly desired. And plant fossils that we talked about when we were looking at pollen grains earlier are really very widely studied and that's because um, they often help to define an ecosystem and they are therefore the drivers of what sort of 
uh, fauna that we have, what sort of herbivores and carnivores might be part of a, a larger food web, often very dependent on the types of producers that we have at that first trophic level. And when we look at distribution of tropical plant species like um, palms or cycads or groups of ferns, then we can often use these as evidence for warmer climates in the fossil, in the geological records. So where we can kind of correlate these things together, it does help us to get a bit of an idea, a bit of a picture of what might what conditions might have been like, at least what climatic conditions in terms of uh, absolute temperatures, temperature ranges and rainfall uh, might have been associated with that period of time. Now these beautiful Glossopterus fossils from about the uh, Permian through to the Triassic are fantastic evidence for continental drift and we found these on a large number of the Gondwanan continents which told us something about their um, the the super cycle about the supercontinent where these guys were all connected at some point. Obviously, um, plants can't get up and migrate from one place to another. So, um, so a distribution that was Gondwanan tells us something about continental drift. But unfortunately, Glossopterus are not as good as um, climate indicators. So they have a more widespread and a more tolerant kind of um, a life cycle, which means that they're actually able to survive in a range of different types of climatic conditions. And of course, that means that we can't use them to pin down exactly what types of conditions might have been present in the past when we find this particular group of fossils. On the other hand, one of my favorite sites is Riversley, and I do have to truncate what I'm doing here because it would be easy to spend the next 45 minutes talking about Riversley and the fossils and, and the fantastic work that's been done to uncover so much knowledge about our ancient, uh, recent ancient past. So Riversley fossils um, have yielded a huge amount of information, not just in terms of a diversity of fauna, but also in terms of climate and what has actually happened over time. A so-called new Riversley fossil site is a more recent one that's been discovered. And in discussing this, one of the um, guys who's been driving this sort of research for a very, very long time is Professor Michael Archer. He said, while the known fossil deposits span and document environmental change over the last 25 million years, there are some holes in the record, including the period between about 13 and 5 million years ago. And this was a critical time during which the widespread lush ancient rainforests of Australia rapidly gave way to increasingly dry conditions. At least some of these new deposits may help to fill out that critical 13 to 5 million year old gap. This is the reason why we go to fossils to help us um, to piece together some of the information that we have about ancient climate change. So by looking at each of these different types of fossils, we get different types of information to give us to help us to build a big picture about both uh, what the flora might have been like in these times, and also what sort of fauna was around. And one of the things, interesting things about Riversley is the incredible diversity of life that there was in Riversley. So one of the things that we uh, have to do when we find fossils is we have to start to piece together some um, information, some assumptions that are based on comparisons between fossil organisms and current organisms, and see how they might link together in order to help us to build this picture. This is one of these uh, images that I really like. You can see lots and lots of these around. So this is a this is an artistic impression, of course, of Riversley 15 to 20 million years ago, being a highly diverse, lush rainforest. Lots of strange, but also familiar uh, animals, including marsupial lions, flesh-eating kangaroos, the large wombat-like diprotodons, uh, tiny koalas, and possums, bats, birds, snakes. I love Monty Pythonoides. Uh, lizards and frogs, uh, just a fantastic diversity of uh, life. Now, whilst, with, whilst this is an artistic uh, impression, no one was there at the time, it's amazing how accurate a lot of these reconstructions can be when we base what we know of uh, current existing animals, uh, their skeletal formations, how muscles attach to bone. So we can use reconstructions to, to try and get to a picture of what life might have looked like. Why does this matter? 
It matters because one of the things that we want to be able to do is look at fossils on the large scale, as well as microfossils, little foraminifera, which we'll talk about in the next um, video, as well as things like pollen grains, to help us build these big pictures of what the climate may have been like in ancient times. Thanks for watching.